voice for a very long time and, and because I felt that we had gone silent. And But I'm interested in both teaching a particular technique, the uh, overtone chanting, um, but also I'm, I'm, what concerns me is, is um, using sound to actually change people's lives, um, to have an actual effect. I think Gurdjieff called it objective music, so sound which actually changes us. And uh, many years ago, I mean, I've been working over 30 years, over 40 years with the voice, and I started realizing that it was very important to honor the ancestors. Um, you know, in, in, in um, the armistice ceremonies here in the UK after the war, um, which we still do to honor the war dead of both world wars, we say we will remember them. So I realized that, that ancestors um, uh, are very important and they have no agency unless the living can, uh, can activate the connection between them and us. And so until then, they, they are like clamorous children trying to make our lives a, a nuisance to remind us to remember to activate these and open these streams of transmission so they can actually do their job, which is to keep the living alive. And, and many cultures acknowledge this. Um, in Japan and, and China, for example, it's, it's, this is very important. And I think when I was teaching in Japan in the early 80s, this was one of the things that I became very aware of. You know, every family at that point had a family altar to honor the ancestors. And so I discovered um, when um, that, that, that when chanting to, to to do this ceremony where people went back through their direct mother's lines um, to honor them through chanting, <clears throat> because each woman has physically given birth to the next one. This is this is quite unique. So going back to the first mitochondrial blob are all these women who have physically given birth to the next one. We're animals after all. And um, and these people um, in, in, in Eastern cultures, they have a job to do, which is to keep the living alive, but, but they have no agency. So we have to activate that. So I, had, I, I created these ceremonies through chanting where people would go back through their mother's lines and then go back through their father's lines acknowledging the direct descendants or, or ascendants, if you like, you know, the mother's mother and the mother's mother's mother and then the father's father and the father's father's father. Of course, there are many, many ancestors, but, but I was just working at that point with the direct lines because I thought this was the most interesting. And I discovered all sorts of amazing things started happening to people. You know, people would ring up and say, what have you been doing? Or suddenly, while we were doing that, we discovered this or another family came a member was discovered and so so just doing that had an extraordinary effect so then i became very interested in much more detailed effect of very specific uh ancestors you know and 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 then asking people why 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 they did what they did you know people who found a career in this or that you know why and how that related to specific things that ancestors had done. Or also, I discovered, especially in my own life, how, uh, but in everybody's lives, how the children find themselves fulfilling the unfulfilled, unfulfilled ambitions of their parents. So very often, parents wanted to do something but couldn't do something. Maybe there wasn't enough money, or maybe a war happened, or something intervened, or, but they really wanted to do something and couldn't. And then the children find suddenly out of the blue, they find they're, they're going along one way and suddenly their life path changes. And when you have somebody interact with you over this to ask these kind of questions, they then realize that they're actually fulfilling the unfulfilled ambitions of their parents. So what is it that is transmitting this intention down the lines? So then increasingly I began to realize this um, inheritance of uh, energetic streams of thoughts, of intentions, of events, unfulfilled events, think interruptions which cause a trauma in the field. All kinds of things were being transmitted down the lines, uh, affecting us. So that what we think we're independent 
uh, people making up our minds about what we want to do. But what I discovered was it wasn't like that at all, that, that what we do in life and how we feel in life, our emotional development, our, our psychological, our physical, it's all related uh, to what members of our families have done before. And so I became increasingly interested in the specifics of these relationships and um, how, they, how they actually worked. And um, so I did these ceremonies and, and then um, I was teaching in Munich um, in the 80s and a woman who organized my workshop said, you know, have you heard of a man called Bert Hellinger? So I said, no. And she said, well, your work is so similar. And then much later on, um, this man, Bert Hellinger, who was a, a, a very elderly um, ex-priest, Catholic priest, um, come therapist, had, had started to work with, with family fields. And he found my husband, Rupert Sheldrake's work, the only way that the scientifically justified what he was working with. And so I came to know this man very well, and he would always come and have dinner with us when he was in London, and, um, and I, I worked with him, and he began to influence my work as well. And so very gradually, more and more specifically, I began to work with individual families and to see um, how these, these uh, transmitted patterns were being played out in subsequent generations. And this is very interesting because um, people have found um, that uh, in, in what's called epigenetics in science, you know, I did a research fellowship in the biophysics department in the 70s with the man one of the three men who got the Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. And at that time, everything was considered to be inherited through DNA. But, you know, Darwin and Lysenko and Lamarck and many, many people before that had always felt there was an inheritance of acquired characters, as it's called. So, um, and then many people started working on uh, the effect of changes in people um, who had been in racial trauma, in famines, like in Sweden in the 19th century or in Holland during the war or displacement of people to Sweden from um, um, Finland during the war or the Irish famine or um, the Holocaust. So they discovered that um, there were physical and change uh, and chemical and emotional and psychological changes in the descendants of people who'd been in trauma, racial traumas. And so increasingly this work, um, it became very clear that this was a much wider picture than the one that I'd been working with and that actually science, in a sense, was catching up with something that we already had discovered in the work. And so, you know, these are some of the things that went into, um, into the work uh, as I became more and more specific in working. And then I started working with groups, with everybody within the group, and some people would come and it, treat it regularly and treat it like therapy. Whenever something came up, that would be the issue they'd be working with. And there'd be some aspect of their ancestral line of forgetting or, or um, interruptions that played into the question and the issue they were working with at the time. And so this is more or less how I got into working with, um, and also the very eccentric nature of my own family and the patterns that went into into that uh, as well. Um, so that's more or less how I started uh, working with uh, family constellations.